So welcome everyone. Uh, it is a great pleasure to restart the first actual seminar live on campus uh, after COVID-19. Our first speaker is Mayor Shimon from Tel Aviv University. Uh, he's been here for a while. He gave a seminar on Zoom uh, last year. I think one of the last ones of, uh, of the last year. And it's great now uh, finally uh, have him in person and to inaugurate our physical seminars. Uh, Mayor of the Academic Department, he'll be here for the rest of the day if anyone wants to speak with him. And without further ado, good luck, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh everybody for uh, coming and I would like to thank the seminar organizers for the opportunity to present my work here about the uh, cosmological implications of val invariant gravity especially we are talking here about a val invariant version of gr general relativity so we will start just a moment For some reason, oh, I wish on the, oh. yes, thank you. Uh, so we start with a brief introduction uh, about the similarities and differences between general coordinate covariance, which is the symmetry of GR, and val invariance, which is uh, the symmetry uh, uh, against uh, uh, rescaling locally rescaling our system of units. And then uh, I'll move on to describe three possible implications of, uh, of this generalization of GR. The first one is, uh, is about the Hubble tension. So you may have heard that there is a tension in, in, uh, in, in present day cosmology between local measurements of the expansion rate of the universe, which is called the Hubble constant, and measurements that come from local and distant uh, measurements of this expansion rate of the universe. Then I'll move on to describe uh, one possible non-singular bouncing cosmology model. According to this model, according to this model, a uh, Big Bang never uh, took place. And so this is a bouncing uh, model in which the universe starts uh, perhaps infinitely large. It contracts, at some point it makes a U-turn, a bounce, and bounces uh, out of this a contraction phase into an expansion phase, the phase that we live in today. And I'll <clears throat> summarize very, very uh, quickly uh, with a discussion about possible implications to the galactic dark matter. This is a topic that I covered in my uh, previous talk here, but here I do that very, very succinctly. So let me uh, just start with the introduction. So in uh, GR, we have general coordinate covariance. This is the underlying symmetry behind GR. The idea is that uh, theory cannot tell you what coordinate system to use. The laws of physics are, uh, of course, uh, uh, absolute. They don't deter. Uh, they don't de uh, depend on the state of the observer. They don't depend on the observer's velocity or acceleration. But the laws are the same laws. So the idea is that, for example, if I observe a black hole, let's say that it's non not spinning, it's just a spherical, spherically symmetric black hole. If, I, uh, if I'm an observer at infinity, I'll describe it with a static metric, Schwarzschild coordinates. But if I'm an infalling observer, I'll describe it with a different metric. And of course, these two metrics are related uh, via coordinate transformation, an appropriate coordinate transformation. And again, only observations can guide me uh, uh, as to my state with respect to this black hole. Now, the theory doesn't allow me to choose my ruler sticks, my yard sticks. So if I uh, make this convention that H bar and C are set to unity, so the Planck length and the Planck mass scales are just the square root of G and the inverse of that respectively. And so uh, when G is a universal constant, then my um, yard stick is a constant, just an absolute constant. So when we say that the universe expands, we mean that space expands with respect to this matter stick. But imagine that in a different system of units, um, space is static, but my art stick just contracts all the time, monotonically. And in this frame, it also seems to me that the universe expands. But actually what, what expands is my 
enthusiastics. So now we have no way to distinguish between the two, uh, no observational way to distinguish between the two, and these will be considered as two equivalent description of the same uh, physical reality. But imagine uh, that there is a more complicated state in which the universe goes through a bounce, and I'll discover that uh, this will be the second item that I will uh, present here. So uh, let's continue with the, with the introduction. So this is a, this is a DS squared is a, just a, a fundamental quantity in GR. This is a, a infinitesimal a Lyon element in four dimensional space time, just telling us the distance between uh, four dimensional distance between uh, two infinitesimally uh, uh, nearby events in space and time. G mu nu is a space time uh, metric, it depends on of course, all four uh, space time uh, coordinates. And x mu uh, with the upper uh, index is the contravariant vector. And this is just a mathematical structure. Therefore, uh, it's a pure quantity. It doesn't have any physical units. The metric, on the other hand, has units of length squared. And therefore, the covariant vector, the vector with a lower uh, strip, uh, has units of length squared. So if you just take the uh, geometric average of these two vectors, you get X, which has length units. This is how it works. Um, so if we locally rescale our uh, uh, scale of unit, the Planck uh, scale that I mentioned earlier, by a multiplication by an arbitrary function of space and time, this omega of X, then G mu nu, which has unit length squared, must scale like omega squared. And these two uh, structures are uh, uh, considered as having well-defined conformal weight. Now, when it comes to calculating the curvature, and here I just uh, symbolically wrote it as an R, but R is not necessarily a scalar, it might be a, a, a curvature tensor, is a function of the first and second derivatives of the metric field. But since the metric field now depends on this omega in the new frame, then uh, although R has units of inverse length squared, it, would, it wouldn't uh, scale like omega to the minus two because of the derivatives that you expect to get from derivatives of uh, the metric field. And therefore, the curvature is not of well-defined conformal weight. So this means in particular that uh, curvature can be infinite in one system of units, but not infinite in a different system of units because it doesn't transform homogeneously under this transformation. So this is again the example that I gave earlier that in principle, uh, you can have a flat and static space without initial uh, singularity uh, in an alternative uh, uh, redefinition of, the, of space and the uh, system of units with which we measure distances uh, on this uh, space. Um, so masses have uh, units of inverse uh, omega, just because masses have inverse lens uh, unit. Um, so I would like to say before we move on to the examples that uh, uh, this extension of general relativity may have far reaching implications uh, on the cosmological uh, model. And certain aspects of the resulting model may significantly differ from those of the standard uh, cosmological model. For example, a new uh, super horizon scan. I'll describe here a, a case in which the case for a, a super horizon scale, which is about 100 times larger than the scale of the observable universe, that might explain within this framework the uh, Hubble tension. Um, I'll also describe the initial singularity in the context of uh, the bouncing, classical bouncing model that I mentioned earlier, and also uh, uh, the nature of dark matter, whether or not it's particulate or it has to do with some mod <coughs> modified version of uh, general relativity. So what is a Hubble tension? This is a compilation from the beginning of uh, 2019. Compilation of experimental results, observational results, uh, should I say? Uh, and so, uh, on the left, uh, top left corner, you can see results from the Planck satellite and uh, some combination of dark energy survey, bionic constellations, and BBM <coughs> decay uh, nuclear synthesis, the formation of the uh, nuclei of the lightest elements in the very early universe. We're talking about. Uh, 
helium, hydrogen, some trace amount of lithium, and some other light elements. And we observe uh, uh, them via the uh, uh, abundance in the universe and we can say uh, something about the expansion rate of the universe. And so all of these, the top left uh, corner, uh, point towards uh, 67, this is the expansion rate in units of kilometer per second per megaparsec. So it has uh, inverse time units. So the inverse of this expansion rate just gives you more or less the edge of the current edge of the universe. In contrast, you see here on the, on the right hand side, a bunch of uh, different uh, experiments uh, which determine uh, edge not which is expansion rate of the universe, have a constant uh, for local measurements. In particular, I'd like to draw your attention to the shoes experiment that uh, uses uh, CFAX to measure at very low edge to, to measure the expansion rate. And there is also the Holy Cow experiment, which uh, determines uh, uh, H naught for <coughs> strong lensing measurements. And there is also a, a method which is based on the red giant in branch. Uh, which at the beginning of 2018 uh, showed <coughs> it was like 72.5. So it seemed back then that all these local measurements converge at something between 72 and 74. And the difference is big, it's about 8 to 9%. But it uh, translates to about five sigma tension between local inferences and distant inferences or primordial inferences of the same parameter in our cosmological model. Now, later in this year, uh, Wendy Freeman uh, published a health paper with a new analysis of the red giant uh, branch method. And she got something like very near 70, was actually 69.8. And according to her, it's, it's more or less not in tension with the CFA, it's more than, but also not in big tension with CMB. So she actually maintains that it's not attention anymore, but uh, the, the debate is still open and most experts in the field are not sure whether or not it's it's a five sigma tension, perhaps even a, a lower tension. Yes, please. How far can you see the set phase? What one? How far can you see the set phase? Well, I cannot tell you the, I cannot tell you the, the exact difference now. I don't remember from the top of my head, but it's a very local universe. Does it get to that equals one or are we talking no, about no, no, one, one point oh one? No, point oh one, something that big. I cannot tell you exact exact numbers. But... Very, very small. <laughs> yes. Well, I well, I think that the error bars are about three percent precision, two percent, but I would expect the larger error bars. Systematic answers. Yes. Well, I, 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 I cannot answer this question. I don't know. Well, systematic error bar is precisely the difference between the set and the CMB. Well, by definition, yes. Um, but if you try to make an estimate with and such, you know, basically you're looking at a really tiny part of the universe. I can just tell you that Adam Weiss published a series of papers uh, using this set method. And according to him and his group, they just control the systematic to the level which is lower than the reported one. So nice. And I'm also not like tells you that the more distant objects you see away from you, the larger velocity, the larger velocity. If all the objects that you see are very nearby, how can you tell the distance in which they are away from you? Well, I, 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 I'm not very fami well familiar with all the details of the analysis that they have done. Uh, as I said, this has been going on for uh, over 10 years and they uh, have been very systematic about the numbers. You can see 2020, 2008, the numbers are more or less at 10 level. Uh, they just need to somewhat increase the, uh, 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 tighten the uh, constraints of this parameter, but otherwise uh, they don't have the same trend uh, that you can see in the CFB that kind of uh, goes down from 70 something at some point to <coughs> seven. So uh, here I get some, what is this? Okay, oh, that's fine, thank you. Uh, oh, yes, yes, please. 
Uh, so the CVs are uh, nearby to us. Uh, the CMB is in, in this. At redshift of 1100, but some of the signal doesn't really come from redshift of 1100. Okay, so I, I should say for the non experts, uh, redshift of 1100 is more or less where the universe was a uh, uh, one thousandth of its current size. Yes. If I understand, if I take this what the values to be correct, the low and high, then does it mean that the nearby universe is extending faster and the distant universe is extending slower? No, no. Uh, when, when we say that uh, the CMB tells us that H naught should be 67 more or less, it means that oh, okay. when you, 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 when you uh, of course, extrapolate it all the way from very high edges to the, to the current universe, to edge zero. So there is, uh, uh, they have to agree on that. So these, these and these are talking about the same, the H naught, not H in general, but H naught, which is H uh, at the current time, the present time. So did I answer your question? Not really. So in, uh, when you measure the H naught by C fix, you find out how the universe is extending in uh, nearby distances because C fix are very nearby to us. Right. At larger cosmological scales, if you see CMB, you say that it is extremely faster. So does it show if, if I take both the values are correct? Can I conclude that they show that the nearby universe is extending faster, the distance is extending slower? No, I, 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 again, again. The CMB is sensitive based mostly to the physics of redshift of 1100, but some of the signal actually comes from relatively low edge. This is an integrated size for the thing. Uh, and actually, edge naught is, is uh, mainly determined by the low edge, uh, not necessarily by the main signal that comes from redshift of 1100. But in any case, what you see here is not the edge that is edge of Redshift of 1100, but the extrapolated value based on, on our model to the present time. This is why the note here, the, the zero that you see. So we are talking here about the exactly the same cosmological parameter. They just disagree on it. Okay. So, uh, so the theory that I would like to discuss here today is a generalization of GR, right? So, so we can start with a well-known GR solution, metric solution, this uh, FRW, Freeman Robots <coughs> uh, Poker solution, and just transform it uh, via a combined coordinate and unit transformation. So the unit transformations are called via transformations, and these are the stretch, local stretching and, and, and squeezing of of the uh, of our yardsticks that I mentioned earlier. Yes, please. Just before I go into this theory, I want to go back to this data. We know that the local uh, the FRW model uh, assumes that the universe is homogeneous with the trophy, mm -hmm. but the local universe is not. Right. right. So how you, use, you just use up in the Hubble. So this is just based entirely on Hubble. Yeah. Why not? Why not? Uh, also, I mean, phenomenologically, observation, this is what you see. So there's no theory involved in this uh, set of several couples. No, no. <laughs> so we start with the FRW uh, Robertson, uh, FRW, which is uh, stands for uh, Freeman Robertson Water Solution. So this is a, this is just a description of a non-empty universe in, in our case, this, uh, which is homogeneous and isotopic. So we observe an isotopic universe around us, the CMB temperature, the cosmic microwave background temperature that comes at us from different direction is exactly the same, up to perturbations at the level of one part in about 100,000. And so also when we observe the large structure in the universe, we don't see any preferred direction. So from our standpoint, the universe, our, our vantage point, the universe is uh, uh, nearly completely uh, isotopic. Now the cosmological principle, which is just a, a, an extension of the Copernican principle, uh, tells us that we don't inhabit any special place in the universe. And therefore any other observer will observe an isotopic universe ar around him or herself. So this is why we use a homogeneous and isotopic description, which is the FRW. So here we have the extension which is described by this A, this is called the scale factor. It's a, a function of uh, time. In our universe, it is a monotonically increasing function of, uh, of time. 
And its exact time dependence, of course, depends on the metal content of the universe. This is determined by the Freeman, which is just one. Uh, actually, actually, all the Einstein equations apply to these, all the 10 uh, Einstein equations apply to this metal field. And we use spherical coordinates. K here is a, the spatial curvature uh, of space and time. So here I just factor this uh, A squared out and just divided B squared uh, by A squared. And I can rename it and call it D eta squared. That's fine. Just changing coordinates in, in general relativity. That's completely fine. Now A is related to the redshift. By this expression, so larger that correspond to smaller a smaller uh, universe, earlier universe. And I'm looking for a new metric. I would like to generate a new metric solution without even going through the generalized Einstein equation of this uh, theory, because I know that this theory uh, is just by related or conformally related to GR. So I'm interested in this kind of, uh, of a metric field, which is uh, just a canonical form of a spherically symmetric metric field. A is an arbitrary function at this point. And I'm also making a coordinate transformation from R prime to R. Uh, so I'm doing here two things. I, 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 I'm going to both uh, apply a value transformation to the old metric and also uh, change the radial coordinate. Now, if you calculate the curvature scalar of this metric, you get something which is only time dependent. And therefore, F of W does respect the cosmological principle. There is no uh, preferred uh, uh, spatial point in, in, in space. Uh, and since it's a scalar, it means that all the observers will agree on this conclusion. When you try to do the same here, you will get that the curvature is R dependent. So, our first concern is, is this metric that I'm seeking is, uh, is not violating the Copernican principle or the, the cosmological principle. And, and the answer to this is that you remember our discussion uh, from the introduction that the Ricci scalar or any curvature scalar is not invariant under value transformation. It is invariant under coordinate transformation, but not under changing our uh, yardsticks. So when you Construct uh, the analog of the uh, Ricci scalar, of the curvature scalar, which, uh, which is a scalar under both coordinate and value transformations, you get that this metric is actually uh, uh, the general curvature of this metric is actually only time dependent. And therefore, the uh, cosmological principle is satisfied. So, of course, I do have this expansion, but in addition, I also have this large function, this prefab or the time coordinate. And this tells us that not only are we going to uh, uh, have a ratchet because of the expansion of the universe, just the wavelength of the CMB of the cosmological background photons being stretched because of the expansion of the universe, we also have the ordinary gravitational redshift or blue shift, depending on, on the trend of A. Yes. A is still a function of time. This is one. Yes. 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 Okay. So it's still a function of time. Now you add up uh, a new function, some new function, capital A, which is a function of R. Exactly. <coughs> so we know, even from our experiment, how do we know that the, the relations between uh, the coefficient of the time coordinate and the coefficient of the R coordinates? Or inverse to each other. This one? Yes, I know it says to be. In principle, you can choose it A of R and B of R. This is just a canonical representation of a spherically symmetric uh, metric. This is what you do when you do Schwarzschild. And Schwarzschild. Yeah, I know. But, ah, okay. I, I can choose a different function. Okay. But uh, I, I show you that it does uh, pretty well without even having to invoke uh, another <laughs> function. And in principle, the idea is that you can always uh, redefine your uh, radar coordinate and get rid of the other. A function just show that a B function is actually inverse A or A to the minus one. So it's a, it's pretty standard in a textbook in GR uh, textbooks. So so this is what I'm doing here. I'm just uh, by transforming the the infinitesimal line element 
And I'm changing, I'm just going from the prime uh, system to the unprime system, which is this one. So if I uh, just, uh, 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 I get, just get uh, three conditions from here to here, from going from here to here, and going from here to here, from the time radial and, and angular uh, coordinates, and I get, I keep getting this, uh, excuse me, this notices. Uh, I get these uh, three conditions. And if I just integrate them together, I get a four A. And A looks like that. So this is a K inherited already from the FRW solution, but here I have an, an, a new uh, integration constant, gamma, which has invert length, uh, length units. You can, of course, extend it in powers of R and get this uh, metric, uh, this A function, where I define the lambda to be this combination, but this is not really important because as you see, I just neglect, uh, neglect this game uh, for reasons that I'll describe later if you ask me uh, the question part of this talk. So this is how A looks like. Just one plus a gamma R over two squared. And therefore the metric in, in the new frame looks like that. Now this is a kind of reminiscent up to the scale factor, this metric. Of course, they are not the same. But the idea that I'm going to describe is the same. This is a the simple metric that just describes in GR an empty space with only a cosmological constant lambda. This is how it looks like. And historically, before uh, Hubble, Edwin Hubble made the discussion, uh, discovery about the redshifting of the universe that led to uh, the acceptance of the FRW <coughs> solution, people, will, uh, people really consider this metric as a metric of the universe. Uh, just uh, after the name of uh, William the Sitter, William the Sitter. Um, of course, there were some conceptual problems with this metric because it was unstable under uh, small perturbations. But, but even before people came to the conclusion that they had to abandon this uh, model, they were talking about the so called uh, the Sitter effect. And so the Sitter effect is just a simple and ordinary uh, uh, gravitation. So uh, imagine that the photon is being emitted at a very large R. So this is a gravitational potential, it's very deep. And when the photon uh, climbs out uh, the potential well in order to get to us at R equals zero, it, uh, uh, the potential when it gets to us, the potential is now vanishing. So it means that the photon must give away energy to the potential well. And so the photon is just being wretched. This is a pure gravitational effect that has nothing to do with the a diabatic expansion of the universe. Now, what we have here is a combination of both this effect and this effect. So we are going now to change the history of the evolution of the CMB temperature. And not only that, we can, uh, we can do the same. We will have the same uh, conclusion also uh, as to the Hubble parameter. So the evolution will be different from the stuff cosmological model thanks to this and new and newly added parameter which comes from Valenvain's uh, 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 symmetry, which is, of course, an extended symmetry that we now apply to GIS. There is something which I feel I don't fully really understand. Sure. When you're adding up this term, you say that there is a range, which essentially depends on the location of the photon. Yes. So that doesn't mean that in this new model, the universe has a center? No, as I said, you can say, the same, you can ask the same thing about let me just go backwards. You can ask the same question, exactly the same question about this metric, which is a standard cosmological model. In this metric I can put in the form of a uh, homogeneous universe. Why? How do you know that it's a homogeneous? Because you calculated the curvature scalar and you saw that it's only time dependent. So when you do the same to this metric, when you calculate a phi inversion a by invariant version of a curvature, and I have a, a backup slides I can show that at the end of this song. You get also something which is only time. Dependent. So, what is the meaning of this uh, redshift of this power basically? Or how do you know if, uh, if a photon goes times half of a potential world or goes into potential? Oh, that's a uh, so let me. So here it's very clear, right? It depends on the sign of lambda. 
Here it's more complicated, but let me just show you the next slide. So in order to answer your question and many other questions, you, what you have to do is to follow the geodesic of the photon. You just have to solve for the geodesic of the photon. And this is how uh, incoming gradual and geodesic seems like. Right? You don't need the uh, de theta and the five uh, 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 things, and you just integrate along the path of the photon, this is A. And so uh, this just gives you the relation between R and time, but time is not an observable. You would like to get the relation between R and Z. So to do that, you have to use the Friedman equation that just tells you the uh, relation. This is just A prime, it's just a derivative with respect to time. So you get here the relation between A, this is the energy density, which depends only on the scale factor. You get the relation between eta and A, but A is a function of Z. You saw that A is one over one plus Z, so it gives you a relation between eta and Z. So you combine it with this relation, which is eta and R, and you get a relation of R and Z. I didn't do nothing, just. So you get this relation. Now you can see uh, that this alpha is just a gamma over two echelon. So you can see uh, that uh, R of Z gives you an effective echelon, an effective echelon which is not the real echelon. This combination, depending on the sign of alpha, you will get either an extra blue shift or extra red shift. And the same. The relation that I show in the next slide uh, is, is also it also applies to the temperature and you can calculate the density. So depend, depending on the sign of gamma which is the sign of alpha, <coughs> uh, just determines if it's a redshift or blue or blue shift. So uh, oh I forgot to say about this. This is a, a dimensionless integral uh, that goes from zero to the uh, desired redshift. And it's also a function of all the omega. Omegas are just the um, contribution uh, uh, of, the, of the energy densities of the various species in the universe. For example, radiation or non relativistic matter. Non relativistic matter is about 30%. Uh, uh, vacuum energy is about 70% of the energy budget of the universe at uh, present time, and so on. Uh, so, this is the, this is a, a pretty standard, uh, this is quite standard in some cosmological model, but here you have a correction. So this uh, tells you that the effective H0 is not H0, but H0 times this prefactor. Now, if alpha is positive and D is level negative, it can be just mm -hmm. monotonically goes from zero to about three at the last scattering surface, you get that this prefactor is smaller than one. So if you have an experiment that probes the CMB at uh, some redshift Z, you will always, if alpha is positive, you will always deduce H0, which is smaller than the real H0, just because you are using the wrong model to analyze your data. You don't know that the universe has a fine invariant, the GR has a fine invariant uh, uh, symmetry. And so if alpha is positive, you will deduce perhaps 67, but in actuality, H0 is 74. This is what is being measured. 72 uh, by, by a local uh, local measurements. <clears throat> Keep getting these uh, updates or whatever. Okay, now of course there is a cost to this game because you also have to rescale all the other quantities, including the Planck mass. Because you saw that if you uh, uh, rescale the length, you also have to rescale the mass. So what you get here is this expression. So the Planck mass that we measure here and now is actually a running uh, uh, quantity. When you go to large R and gamma is positive, it simply, it simply increases. But if gamma is about uh, 100, uh, it's, uh, if inverse gamma is about 100 times larger than the scale of the observable universe, you are going to get here something like 1% difference. And again, no one really measured the Planck mass at the edge of the universe, right? So this doesn't seem to violate any known result. But this 1% uh, change here is going to give a 9% change in the edge not. And I'll show that, uh, I hope, in one or two more slides. So the variation in CMB is of the order of the minus 5. Uh, yes, like fraction, fractional change. 
And that's not a measurement of flat mass, but maybe it's a measure of uh, flat structure constant or the yes, sure. electron mass or one of those. These are not going to change because, uh, okay, uh, I, I may have failed to say that in the introduction, or at least to emphasize that. The VAL invariance applies only to uh, gravitation. It doesn't apply to the standard model of particle physics. So alpha is going to stay the same. The inertial mass of the electron is going to stay exactly the same as in the standard model. But uh, I'll show that later on in this, uh, during this talk, uh, the same scalar field that I'm going to add to the theory that, uh, that regulates the evolution of G, of Newton's big G, it's not going to be a universal constant, but rather a field. Uh, also determines, uh, and therefore, a plant mass also determines the active gravitational masses, the masses that generate or produce the gravitational field. So what you see here is an effect that had to do with the active gravitational masses and the plant mass, but not with the mass of the electron, not with the fine structure constant and so on. So I'm just leaving the solid model of particle physics as is and not making any changes. So, uh, so here we are at the point to show is that after you propose a model, we would like to see how well this model performs against the data, right? So we have a... I'm pulling you. Just say something which seems contradictory. You say that the plant mass is changing with time, basically. Like uh, with the R. It's R, right? But the electron mass and then, you know, other particles masses are not changing. Oh, then, yes. then that, that necessarily implies that some other physical constants must change. Either C is changing with time or G is changing with time. Something G, must G, G of course changes with time because the Planck is a one over square root of G, of course. Right. C, and C, is C, C and H bar are set to unity. C sure. and H bar, you're not touching. Yeah. So, just, so, so the only thing that changes in, in your model is, is G. G and the uh, active gravitational masses. Yeah. Okay, so, so you want uh, to compare your model to the, your data and, and see how well it performs with, uh, in comparison to the data. So, so what kind of data, uh, data sets we have? We have the Planck 18, 318, which is a, a most recent and final data release of the Planck satellite, the European satellite that uh, uh, mapped the CMB sky and, and measured uh, 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 Measure, uh, measure the uh, CMB fluctuations and polar temperature anisotropy and, and polarization down to uh, a few arc uh, minute scales. We have about uh, 2,500 data points uh, from uh, the Planck uh, satellite. Uh, there is also the dark energy survey, which just uh, measure the uh, correlations in the large scale structures. Large, large scale structure. We have bionic oscillations, which is just the input of uh, uh, primordial uh, uh, plasma oscillations on the large scale structure correlation. We have the shoes measurement, of course, measured, uh, 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 mentioned at the beginning of this talk. And we have a catalog of about uh, 1,000 uh, type 1a supernovae, which are considered as uh, sour tenders, spanning the entire energy from 2 to 0.01, something. Yeah. And there is, of, of course, the combination of all these. So what I show here is a result of a Monte Carlo simulation, sampling the uh, uh, parameter space. The parameter space includes about up to 30 nuisance parameters that have to do with the calibration of the CMB measurements, uh, supernovae, that in the survey, and so on. And uh, about six more fundamental cosmological parameters, one of them is H0. And there are a few other derived parameters to which uh, these, uh, these uh, probes are, are not uh, directly sensitive, but once you know all the other parameters, you can derive it. One of them is SA. So uh, I've been using Cosmo MC, which is a standard tool in uh, the cosmology uh, community. And of course, I had to tweak it to, to make some tweaks to adjust it to the new model that I'm proposing here. Uh, it was a painstaking work, but after you do that, you can uh, actually uh, start uh, concerning the parameters. Here you see for, uh, for each uh, leap, so for two, you can see the one and two sigma confidence uh, levels and the posterior distributions. So alpha, you can see that 
uh, vanishing alpha or negative alpha is rejected more or less at about three sigma. By I, you can see that with all the different combinations. So this means that I added a parameter which is actually seem to be required by the data. It's not quite consistent with zero or something. And three sigma is quite uh, significant in cosmology. It's not a particle <coughs> physics that we need at least five sigma. There is an H node and S8. S8 is kind of a, a modern version of sigma, a descaled version of uh, sigma eight, which just measures the mass uh, fluctuations on about 10 mega parsec scales. Uh, usually, again, this is a derived parameter. CMB itself is not directly sensitive to sigma eight or S8. What usually happens is that uh, a solid model predicts S8, which is larger than what you expect, expect based on the natural probes of uh, sigma eight, which are galaxy clusters. We are talking about this two sigma ten tension. Here you see that according to this model, H naught and S8 are anti-correlated. So if you can somehow increase the boost H naught upwards, you also uh, decrease S8. So it's a solution to both the Hubble tension and to a mild solution, which is S8 tension in the model. Alpha is a show of is uh, when alpha moves uh, up, H naught also goes up, which is, a, which is what we said there at the beginning. And you can say that the strength of the anti-correlation between alpha and S8, so the same alpha that goes up and boosts the H naught also lowers S8. Now, this one is not really trivial because there are uh, no standard models that solve uh, the H naught problem, but actually worsen uh, the S8 problem because in other, some of the other models, there is a correlation between H naught and S8. So this is a very fortunate a, a, a situation that the same alpha can solve these two uh, models, not one on the expense of the other. Uh, I think that uh, I'm kind of running out of time, right? Or do I have the time? Um, about 15 more minutes, but you can go a little bit. Okay, bit. okay. So, so maybe I uh, spend some uh, one or two minutes on this uh, slide. So um, that's all good and, and nice, but, but, but you want really to quantify how well the model performs. So you have to do a, actually a, what is called a model selection or model comparison in, in the language of, uh, model, uh, <coughs> uh, of, uh, of statistics. So these are the five data set combinations that I mentioned earlier that you saw in the previous uh, slide. And these two columns uh, are the DIC. DIC is deviance information criterion. Deviance, uh, deviance, uh, deviance, deviance uh, information criterion is, uh, is some uh, version of chi-square. The lower numbers that you get, the better fit you get. But DIC is, uh, is not really a simple chi-square. Uh, there is a penalty calculated within this DIC for any extra parameter that your model had and is not well concerned by the data. Because in principle, you can always add many, many and more uh, parameters and lower the chi-square, right? So you would like to have the most economic model because there is a penalty inc incurred on unnecessary new parameters. And this is, uh, there are many, of course, uh, uh, criteria to do that. Uh, DIC is kind of a midway between frequencies and Bayesian approaches. And it's quite common in our field. So these are the DIC values for the standard model, and these are for the value value model. So you can see that the numbers are systematically lower. Here, the, both the uh, figures are showing the gain that you have uh, with respect to the standard model, each model. So all of them you notice are uh, better than five units of gain. So according to the Jeffrey scale, which is a standard, a, a standard with which we compare models. If you have a gain of one, this means that the new model is weakly preferred over the old model. If it's between one and three, it's mildly preferred. If it's between three and five, it's strongly preferred. And if it's uh, over five, it's decisively favored. So assuming that we believe the shoes, uh, shoes result, the safety result, this model is, is, is a decisively favored over the standard cosmological model as a fit to uh, the current data. I've repeated the same analysis without the shoes experiment. 
And then I got that these two models compete with each other with even a slight edge uh, in favor of the standard uh, model. Yes, please. Uh, <coughs> column, is, is it the evidence ratio? This one? Yes. Evidence ratio, you are talking about Bayesian analysis. Evidence ratio is a concept from uh, Bayesian analysis, as far as I know. But that's what the uh, Right, ratio. but that's true. Uh, historically, that, that was true. But this uh, turns out to, uh, well, at least not a, uh, he's argued by, uh, by uh, accepted in our field in cosmology, uh, that it also applies to the DIC. Which is, can you explain? Yeah. DIC, yeah. yes, the DIC uh, combines, uh, uh, combines uh, uh, say, the ideology of both uh, Bayesian and frequentist approach. So, in the Bayesian approach, uh, you have one data set, for example, or fixed data set, and you vary the parameters. In the frequentist approach, you have uh, uh, set of parameters, you try to find the best fit data. <coughs> best fit. So you have a fixed theory and you <coughs> like to play with the data and find the best, best uh, uh, match between them. So this DIC, and there are papers about that, I can uh, refer you to, to papers uh, in, in our field that actually made comparisons and, and some studies about that. This is kind of a, a, a compromise between these two uh, different approaches. But in any case, uh, even without that, you see that alpha is, uh, is uh, different from zero at about uh, three, three sigma. So the likelihood for alpha being negative is less than one, one in 2000, more or less. So the other uh, topic that I would like to cover here is a uh, non-singular bounce in cosmology. Usually we think about we, we, uh, usually we think about uh, uh, bouncing cosmology as something that has to come from quantum gravity, because according to uh, 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 Heisenberg principle, you can't really localize the entire energy density of the universe, the entire matter, all the matter in a single point, which is a big bang. There must be some softening of the singularity. And the belief is that, and there are of course many string inspired models that the universe starts out uh, very large, perhaps infinitely large contracts. So H naught is negative because it's a negative expansion. So it's a contraction. It goes through a bounce. So momentarily it goes through zero, zero and then start expanding. So we have a positive H naught. So the condition for having a, a bounce, the minimum condition is that at some point H naught vanishes. Now you may recall from the uh, Friedman equation that H naught is proportional to the total energy density. But the total energy density for the total energy density to vanish, this means that you must have some contribution which has negative energy. And this is something that we don't like in physics, right? So you must in, uh, invoke some exotic form of matter in order to have, let's say, non quantum gravity uh, uh, inspired uh, bounds. But, but uh, I'll try to convince you here that there is perhaps a way out that has to do with the value invariance of, of GL. So this is just an Einstein-Gilbert action. Uh, alpha here is IG. Again, I remind you that C is set to unity. So here we have the curvature scalar and the metal Lagrangian, the source of the gravitational interaction. When you calculate the curvature scale of the FRW metric, here I'm still within <coughs> GR, instead of action. You get this expression, which is, again, as I said earlier, it's only time dependent, doesn't depend on R. When you, when you plug it into this action and integrate by parts, you get this expression. You can convince yourself that it's, 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 it's pretty uh, uh, simple to show that. And so uh, this looks like a kinetic term plus a polynomial in A, because uh, the metal imagine is a polynomial a in A in, in the South cosmological model. So this looks like a scalar field theory. So you have a scalar field theory on a static background because G uh, is related to uh, wiggle G, which is a extending uh, frame. 
via A squared. So G mu is basically uh, the non-expanding part, the, the part of the metric that multiplies A squared. So you have a, a, a scalar field theory with the kinetic and potential terms defined on a static space. I can rename this A squared, get this expression, which looks like more like a, a scalar field theory without this uh, coupling to R. And even, even then, you can, if R is constant, for example, you can absorb this in the definition of the metal attraction. And this is indeed the case here. Because we are talking about a constant curvature uh, uh, space time, which is which is FRW. But this is FRW. If we would like to get a, a covariant version of that, so the kinetic term will just transform to phi u phi u. Ah, sorry. Sorry, I forgot to sign my my comment. Very sorry for that. Okay. So, uh, so this is a covariant version of this one. And imagine that this theory is our theory of gravity, from which you can, of course, go backwards and, and derive the FRW. So, this theory was actually proposed 50 years ago by Stanley Bessel. Uh, he wrote down a theory which is a bi-invariant version of GR. Uh, here you see the phi, which is a, a specific a explicit uh, dependence of the metal version on this scalar field phi, because he was thinking about uh, phi only as a function, or, or only as replacement for G of Newton's G. And he added this kinetic term in order uh, for this. Two uh, components together to be val invariant if you multiply them by the volume. <laughs> so in his case, this phi was a, a metal version didn't really depend on phi. I'm adding it because I would like the fluid to apply not only to radiation sources but also to massive sources. And for that purpose, I had to restore the phi in here. So it's not really the Zell, not the Zell uh, proposal, but kind of a tweak on the is a uh, proposal. Yes, please. Uh, I'm just trying to get the thing here in my head. So when you write down the action of the FRW, you write down you know, this, uh, and the deserve one, or the qualified deserve one. Okay. But you basically replace the time dependence of chi right, with an R dependence of phi. No, yes, uh, of course, this, this is not a cosmological model. This is just a vibe that scale depends on theory. So I just use right. that as a guidance, just use that as a guidance for constructing a value version. It's not the same action, you see? Well, the action has the same shape, right? Exactly. So I just want to show you that if you can go from here backwards and get the FRW. So essentially, you're trying to rewrite the FRW to action in a different, uh, you know, it's the same form, but with a different variable, which will now not depend on the time. Of course, but I didn't finish because I'm going to add here a phase to this scale of it. So I'm going to add an extra. Uh, I'm trying to get the physical uh, intuition of what you're what sure. doing. So the intuition is that is that uh, you, you remember that R is not does not have a well-defined conformal weight because when you calculate it, you get derivatives of omega. So you need some compensation in order for this piece when you multiply it by the volume element, which has uh, which has like omega to the fourth power because it's a determinant of G, you want it to be independent of omega. How are you going to do that? If you have a kinetic term, because from the derivatives of phi, you're also going to get derivatives that will cancel the derivatives of this. And this entire thing will have conformal weight of minus four, which exactly balances the conformal weight of this one, which has conformal weight of plus four. So this is why you need the kinetic term for the scalar field, which is none other than the Planck mass. So this is why it has to be dynamical. Now, the prefactor one of over, one over six here is essential because if you don't have one, if you have any other prefactor here, then phi will depend on the metal content of the universe. It will be just a standard scalar tensor theory of gravity. It won't uh, it won't be a manifestation of binary variant. The same uh, symmetry that I was talking about at the beginning of this. 
So this is why you need exactly this full fat complex. You get it uh, automatically if you start with FRW and you generalize it. Now, the next thing to do, and it's not something that we must do, but this is an addition that I added to it, you just make this a, a scalar field and be complex. And if, if, it's, if it's a complex scalar field, this means that in the FRW case, which we consider, which is the main interest of this topic, uh, the scalar field is homogeneous. Therefore, the module sky is only eta dependent. Alpha is also a, a, a purely eta dependent, time dependent. When you write down the action, it looks like that. So you have here a new contribution. If the metal Lagrangian is positive, you have here a negative contribution. Remember that for a bounce, you need the energy density at some point, not the energy density to vanish. So the bounce is going to be due to this phase. So if you write down, if you just write down the, if you just write down the, the <coughs> oil and logic equation for this alpha, since, since it's a, a cyclic coordinate in a cyclic coordinate in field space. There is no explicit value on alpha, you get this expression. So this is a conserved charge. You can vary alpha, alpha prime, but you also have to vary chi squared in conserve so that the product will be a constant. You can also calculate this term up to the minus sign and get that it goes like chi to the minus two. But remember that chi is just a renaming of k. So this important, uh, this uh, term is important at very low a. So if you just write down the oil Lagrange equation for the chi field, this is how it looks like, <clears throat> pretty much like the Friedman equation, but instead of a prime over a, you have chi prime over a, a, a over chi. Of course, everything is formulated on a static universe. Therefore, we don't uh, say that the universe contracts and then expands. We say that it starts in blue shifts, and at some point it uh, makes a turnaround and then red shifts. So you have the uh, ordinary metal over chi squared minus alpha prime squared. So this is how the ordinary metal looks like. A plus B chi plus C chi to the four power. A is just radiation. It doesn't have uh, in this frame any dependence on chi. Thus, so a, a non-relativistic metal is linear in chi and, and, and vacuum energy or something like the cosmological constant is quartic in, in, in chi. I'm not going to... Uh, and show it now, but I can, say, I can explain that later. But anyway, the point is that when chi is very small, this the numerator here is dominated by a, so you get a over chi square minus b over chi to the four. So when chi is sufficiently low, this becomes sufficiently negative. At some point, it balances this a over chi square, and the unit deep in the uh, radiation dominated universe, there must, must be some. Bounce. I lost the uh, I lost the uh, picture. So oh, thank you. Okay. Yes. Pardon me. Okay. And, and this uh, and this point is exactly when d uh, over a is uh, when chi uh, uh, hits the d over a uh, square root of d over a point. This is where we have the bounce. So the entire bounce is due to this D, which, is, which comes from, from A prime. So we can think about that as a, as a particle, just an, an, an analogy to a particle moving as in a central field or in a central force, and there is a centrifugal barrier. This is a chi squared times alpha prime that I mentioned earlier. So the centrifugal barrier doesn't uh, let him hit the singularity. The same way here, the centrifugal barrier that comes from this alpha prime doesn't uh, allow a singularity, you have a classical bounce. It's not quantum gravity. And by choosing D, you can have the bounce at different uh, A values. Of course, observationally, uh, we know that the universe must have started before BBM, which is actually for 1 billion or 10 billion. Uh, the big bang interest is since this that I mentioned earlier, but it doesn't have to start at the Planck scale, like in uh, many, or 100 times Planck scale, like any, like many other string uh, inspired uh, cosmologies uh, propose, yes. Um, two related, separated, related questions. 
One, is there anything in the theory that tells you what are the values of DNA, maybe where, you know, what? There is radiation, so we know it in Odino. No, it's a free parameter. It's a free parameter. So you do not know when the bounce will happen. Exactly. And the second question is because it's a constant, it's a constant of integration. You don't know. Yes, so you don't really know. Yeah. The second question is is there any observational uh, hint towards this scenario? No, no, no. Okay. no. The only thing that we have is that uh, we know that GR phase is very well, uh, our sound cosmological model starts with a singularity where uh, GR force uh, fails. So, of course, as I said, there are many proposals for bouncing cosmologies. This is just one of many others, which is based on some uh, uh, symmetry principle. So, I also checked, of course, I'm going to, not going to show it here. Uh, the model is also stable at and near the bounds because uh, many uh, models that uh, explain, uh, explain the bounds at the, at the background level. Just break, break down uh, at the linear, linear perturbation uh, levels because in the contracting universe, some of these perturbations tend to grow uh, unboundedly, and then uh, the entire linear approximation breaks down. So I made a stability analysis to this model and it passes uh, my tests. So the last point that I had also just as uh, you know, if you remove spherical symmetry, base symmetry, phi, theta. Well, the, the only parameter is that that, that is analogous to uh, to uh, to rectangle spherical symmetry is alpha. If you think about that, alpha is a measure uh, is a measure of the so-called uh, anisotropy of the universe. But remember that unlike other models that you may have been talking about, it has to do with a stiff matter like. Uh, Right when the universe is like beyond you, are talking about like beyond you kind of models that uh, there is a different uh, squeezing along different uh, 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 axes of the universe, and therefore this uh, thing uh, goes like a stiff matter. But this stiff matter that you saw here has a negative energy, so once it becomes to dominate, the universe makes a bounce. So you don't really hit the singularity with a like PKL instability or something like that. If you were thinking. Uh, in this sense. So the last thing universal the moment of what? Strong Will you generate what? Gravitational waves. Ah, okay. So what I've done here is only only a scalar relativity definition. I don't introduce any. I don't introduce any element that may source gravitational waves. I don't uh, introduce any anisotropic stress, for example. So I don't see how this can interfere with any, no, anything that you know about gravitational waves. And remember, remember that this doesn't really, this bound doesn't really have to take place at very, let's say, a dense, a dense, a dense universe. It can take place uh, maybe. Uh, the redshift of uh, 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13, when the, unit, when the typical energy was 10 times uh, the energy scale of VBM. It doesn't have to go really deep into the nearly uh, quantum gravitational regime. So I, I don't know about that. I just don't see, think, I mean, uh, that this can uh, necessarily or expectedly make any contribution to strong gravitation waves or something like that. Okay. Let's, let's take two minutes with our questions just to read the concluding remarks, and then we'll have a, a full question. Okay, so, so let me just say I say that uh, how many years ago, and the previous time, and I don't know. So, just we have a problem of dark matter. We know that we need it in, in galactic, uh, on galactic scales. This is just a rotation curve that we probably saw many, many times. We need them in uh, galaxy cluster and bullet cluster systems, uh, growth of structure. Uh, since the recombination until the present time. And all, we also need them for the background uh, space time. So we know that from the CMP that we need about 30% in the form of dark matter of a uh, non relativistic matter, while we know only about 5%, which is the baryonic matter. So we need about 25% on cosmological scales, which is believed to be formed by some dark matter. 
So let's assume that there is no particular uh, particular dark, dark matter. There is dark matter phenomena. I'm not uh, denying that. All I'm saying is that maybe there is a solution that doesn't have to, to do with the matter sector, but rather with the gravitational sector. So this is just a linearized method over a Minkowski space time. So the gravitational potential, the weak gravitational potential, we are talking really about the linear gravity, right? The Newtonian level. So the, uh, the gravitational potential is only source by variance here and here. Here uh, you see only the spatial coordinates, here's the time coordinates, and here you have a mix term, and V is just a velocity term, which is already a first order correction. Now we are going to shift the gravitational potential. How are we going to do that? We are going to apply a variable summation. So it's going to be one plus small function. Let's say that this small function is smaller than 10 to the minus uh, three. It of course varies in space and time, but its amplitude is very small compared to unity. So when we do that, we get the shift of the potential at linear order. Of course, there will be a correction here, but it will be only second order. So this potential, I can call it a phi dark matter, and I can choose this function to be whatever function I want. If I can rescale my units uh, at my, my uh, <coughs> according to observations, right? I determine that uh, by, by just comparing two observations. So, so of course, there is a cost, like we saw in, the, in other examples here, the Schwarzschild values, uh, G times the active gravitational mass, case like this. So it's going to change the, the potential uh, uh, universal constant is going to change by, let's say, one part in 10 to the three. We don't really have a, a precise and indirect measurement of G on this scale, the galactic scale, at the level of one part in 1,000, right? And we turn the gravity completely fast on this case. This is why we need to involve dark matter. So the, the idea is that instead of dark matter, maybe there is a wider symmetry than we really think which has to do not with strong gravity, but rather with the foundations of a, a gravitational interaction. In particular, I can choose this phi dark matter to be the phi dark matter, which is uh, extensively used in the physics of dark matter, which is NFW, the bow of n y. This is how it looks like on galactic scales or galaxy cluster scales more, more, more precisely. But I can choose any other form that I want, just make a fit to the data and see what I get. This will tell me how G is being distorted on these, uh, uh, on these scales. Draw the conclusion. Yeah, so exactly the same can be done on cosmological uh, scales. Uh, there are the perturbations that I said at the last cutting uh, surface, but there the perturbations are on the level of one part in 100,000. So the situation is even simpler. We don't have a measurement of G on these scales. So why not? Uh, making uh, small perturbations with the RMS uh, fluctuations of 10 minus three, uh, five, and, and, and just get a uh, read of the dark matter at least at the level of perturbations. I'm not talking here about the background. This, uh, say, this deserves a separate discussion. So let me just summarize. Variance is perhaps as fundamental as, as fundamental asymmetry as general coordinate covariance. This is the main point of this talk. A few key uh, uh, problematic puzzles in the standard cosmological model can be addressed when GR is extended to be a binary theory. We saw a few of them. And there are other far-reaching implications for these generalized uh, approach to GR, working and few others. Uh, but of course, these are not at the level that I can describe here. So that's all I had to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Once you introduce G as a function of time, what? When you introduce that G is a function of time, yeah, that means the curvature is not absolute for two dimensional observers. Two observers will see different curvature. Two observers will see different different curvature. Uh, well, two uh, observ uh, uh, observers. Uh, when you said uh, we're well, talking about the static model that I mentioned, no, you introduce that G should be capital G should be a function of time. R means the distance should be different. So where two, where was it that it's a function of time? Uh, it's function of R, you say. Capital G is function of R. Ah, yes. Yeah. So R means different in time as well. R, where, where the origin of coordinates is defined at me, for example. This is the G that I'm seeing. You will define your uh, origin of coordinates, which is at you, 
at your place and you will see your gene. Okay, so, so you will see different curvature in the particular place, I will see different curvature. The curvature is normal and absolute. <coughs> you see, the curvature, as I said, when you think about curvature, you think in terms of GR. But my point here, and this is one of the things that I try to explain in the introduction, you have to consider a gener generalized quantity, which is not really the R, but some different quantity, which has to do with R, but also derivatives of a gravitational uh, constant of G of phi. Of the plant mass. Let me perhaps let me see. I don't remember what what of these uh, I have it. Oh, it will take some time. Okay, so oh, let me see. I think that this is the thing. So you see. If you consider this quantity, this combination, then it has a well-defined conformal weight. R times phi doesn't have a well-defined conformal weight with that, uh, because of the derivative issue that I mentioned earlier, but this combination has a well-defined uh, coordinate weight. So imagine that you take this combination and divide it by uh, phi to the, uh, like quadratic power of phi, phi to the third, uh, 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 to the third order. So it means that this uh, ratio will be independent on omega. So if you take this quantity and divide it by phi to the three, and you calculate, you get a scalar not only under coordinate transformation, but also under violet transformation. So when we talk about this quantity that I'm proposing, this order of phi to the third uh, order, then both you and I will agree on the result. So it's not really a curvature, it's a curvature plus some, some correction that has, that has to do with the requirement that your new curvature scalar, not the old one, the new one, should be invariant under violent transformations. Yes. Yeah, uh, bouncing uh, universe will uh, have an effect on the violent oscillation. So that we should see the imprint of that if it happens on the fluctuations in the cosmic number of breakout. Well, why should why should it have an impact? I mean, I see I said that the, the bounce, let's say that it takes place before a heat of uh, 10 to the 9. Bionic oscillations uh, are uh, taking place somewhat before, let's say, uh, a redshift of uh, 1100 more or less, right? And this is where they decoupled from radiation. This is what's where they decoupled from the equation of the fluctuations. From what happens to the universe before? Yes, you are right. Uh, what you say is that it's so close in Big Bang that it's not really that. Of right. course, so the size of the universe and the, uh, the bounce when it took place at DBN, it's a more or less 10 times larger than the solar system, which is nothing, in, uh, of course, in, this, in, in, uh, in cosmological terms. Yes. Um, yes, please. So uh, I was curious to know about this. You say that there's a Hubble constant uh, configured by using the red giants. Uh, red giants. Yeah. The tip of the red giant. Right. Yeah, that's the, and then the, you compare the other models from other sources. And uh, I was curious to know how much it's reduced uh, the Hubble constant and uh, which model you used to convict this. Uh, well, of course, these are data analysis that I'm not really familiar with. I mean, yeah, I, I I'm not an expert on. If you check it on, yeah. So, yes, you are talking about that, I guess. Let's uh, show that to everybody. <coughs> yes, yeah. so, so, yes, so earlier this year, the result from the peak of the red giant branch was about 72.5, and a few months later, she updated the, the, the value to uh, 69.8. So, uh, so they analyzed the, uh, uh, the data, realized the data, there is the issue of dust and many, many other things. And of course, I'm not an expert in this field and people kind of uh, still debating. Uh, again, can you compare with the model that you so, so uh, yes, of course, I have compared with this one. And if, it's, if the result is this one, this means that gamma is going to be smaller. 
And so it won't be a three sigma, perhaps it'd be one or 1.5 sigma. I don't you know, as I said, my results depend on my, the analysis that, uh, the data analysis that I've taken. But I can tell you that it's not only these three different methods. This is what is shown in here. But if you look here, you have also strong lensing measurements, which also show that it's 73.3. And later on, it actually increased to 75 point something. So it's systematic, I mean, systematically all the local universe scopes shows something like 72, 74, something like that. And of course, this is an, an outlay. It's a, a outlay, of course, outlay in the sense that it really is different from all the other local measurements. It is the updated result, updated analysis, yes. And these are generally what we use, so that's fine. This one. Around 70, 71. So when we make publication. Okay. And before it was 69. Yeah. But now in this case we are using 70. Yeah. Right. So, so the problem is again, the, the real problem is not the, the actual value. The real problem is the, the tension, the five sigma tension. Mm -hmm. So we we came to the point that our measurements are so precise that five like few percent difference is a, it comes up to about mm -hmm. the five sigma tension. Right? And again, I'm not saying, all I'm saying is that, let's say that it's 74. If it's 74, this is what you get. If it's 72, it will be a different value. Maybe uh, it turns out that all this is just a, you know, a systematically flow the measurements and results, and therefore we, we are stuck with this. And then, uh, of course, there is no point in modifying the standard model. But currently, we do have attention. And again, each different model has its own systematics. And it's pretty... For me, at least, I'm, I'm a theoretician, so for me, it's really convincing that you see a bunch of different measurements, different methods that more or less all of them agree distinctively different from what you see from the very early universe. Again, up to this uh, uh, change in this uh, TRGB uh, uh, measurement uh, analysis. Yes. Question? <coughs> So in this bouncing universe model, how does it how does it address the problem of hydrogen regeneration? The long term one hydrogen should be over. I didn't get the question. Hydrogen in the models that have indefinite phase of the universe, the problem is that all hydrogen should be over converting into helium and other materials. So how does this bouncing universe model address the problem of hydrogen regeneration? How do how do we see the student hydrogen in the universe? Well, you are talking about you are talking about recombination or about uh, nuclear synthesis? No, I'm talking about in general in the, in the universe, the hydrogen is continuously converting into helium. So once you talk about infinite of the universe, all hydrogen should have been powered by. Ah, you're talking about something like the second law of thermodynamics? No. No, the fuel should run out in the universe in long term. That's why this finite, infinite age model, model of the models in the universe fall apart compared to the So, how does it address? You see, there is a, a, if there is any some trace amount of helium that has been formed in the infinite universe before the bounce, if you are looking to that, this has been all destroyed uh, in, the, in, the, in the collapse phase and the bounce, right? If the bounce took place sufficiently early before BBN. No, isn't it? BBN is the formation of the light elements, right? So if, even if you had the elements in the conducting phase, these have been all destroyed during the, the bounce or near the bounce, right? So now you start the whole story and you... The point is that the only thing that we know in observation cosmology is more or less a bounce onwards. We don't really know what really happened before that. We talk about the phase transitions in the very early universe, inflation, everything, but these are things that we don't really directly know, right? So I think that it is sufficiently safe to assume that the bounce took place, uh, let's say, when the universe was 10 times smaller than the BBN size, or 100 times, or 1,000 times smaller. But you don't really have to go all the way to plus. This is my point. So the universe may have taken place when it was about a, a bounce, when the universe was about 10 to the 15 centimeter. You don't really have to go to the 10 to the minus 33 centimeter in order to the bounce. This is how you can go around the problems of, of quantum gravity. You don't really need quantum gravity to explain the bounce. 
if you assume this uh, kind of field, the scalar field, which is a valid invariant and with a phase, because uh, I assume, just assume that phi is complex. It doesn't have to be the case. I just consider the tender possibility that maybe we have a valid invariant version of GR with a complex scalar field. Yes, please. So to that, if you have a balance that can happen essentially not quite arbitrarily, like you can so if you can essentially choose the time that the balance happens, that yeah. will affect your measurement of the age of the universe. And does that affect then how you extrapolate back the global constant if you're measuring it very The age of the universe, well, we are talking about like the bounce, even, even if the bounce took place before the big bang, big bang, we're talking about the first few seconds, seconds after the big bang. Even two place two seconds after the big bang. So it's, it's really not significant. Cosmologically, it's nothing. Okay, let's thank our speaker again. I'm stopping the recording, the recording, but if anyone wants to come up and ask questions, you, you can still do that. Uh, the recording is.